The Nintendo Game Boy is one of the most successful gaming platforms ever, with a staggering 120 million units sold between its original and color iterations alone. Originally launched in Japan in 1989, it has been offered in multiple incarnations throughout its lifespan, from the ubiquitous brick to the improved Game Boy Pocket to the elusive Game Boy Light. It contributed to consolidate existing franchises like Tetris, Super Mario, and Metroid by offering slimmed-down, portable versions of the familiar video game experiences, but it also played host to many original ideas and ventures, like the Juggernaut Pokemon series. Despite being incredibly successful, the Game Boy was actually quite underpowered for its time. The Sega Game Gear was released just a year later, sporting a backlit full-color LCD and almost direct ports of games for its older sibling, the Master System. And yet, Nintendo's system prevailed. Their decision to use older, simpler components and a monochrome display meant that their device launched at a price $60 lower than their eventual competitor and sported an amazing 30 hours of battery life compared to the Game Gear's 5. So what actually is inside a Game Boy? What made this awesome concentration of fun tick? Let's find out. If you take your old black and white brick and slice it open, you'll find that most of the room is actually taken by the battery compartment and the screen. The actual brain of our little friend is this circuit board marked DMG CPU. DMG stands for Dot Matrix Game, which was Nintendo's code name for the original Game Boy. On this board, you'll find the few central components. The CPU, 8 kilobytes of work RAM, 8 kilobytes of video RAM, and the cartridge slot. The CPU is a modified version of the Zilog Z80, a processor created in the 70s that was extremely common all the way through the mid-80s and is still found in some scientific calculators. The Game Boy's custom version gets rid of some less used functions but also contains some special extra hardware, a four-channel sound generator and a picture processing unit, or PPU, to generate graphics. It runs at a staggering 4.16 MHz, or about 0.1% of the speed of a modern processor. It's an 8-bit processor with a 16-bit memory address space. 16 bits can hold a number between 0 and 2 to the power of 16. Each of the positions represented by those 16 bits can contain a number from 0 to 2 to the power of 8. In more relatable terms, the Game Boy can handle 64 kilobytes of memory and can mostly only deal with numbers from 0 to 255. This is not uncommon for CPUs from that era. They were generally extremely limited, and most of them, including the Game Boys, could not even natively perform operations like multiplication and division. Now let's take a look at how the CPU actually works. This is interesting because a lot of the concepts apply to the same architecture we have in our computers nowadays. The Game Boy CPU has 10 registers, labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, H, L, S, P, and P, C. Registers are super fast memory cells physically located directly inside the processor. Each of them can hold an 8-bit number, with the exception of S, P, and P, C, which serve a special function and can contain 16-bit numbers. A is arguably the most important register, called the accumulator, as most mathematical operations can only be performed on this register. Of course, 10 numbers aren't nearly enough to hold all the data that's necessary to run a game, which is why the CPU is connected to the work RAM. The work RAM offers 8 kilobytes of storage, or about 8,000 cells, that can each hold a number between 0 and 255. The RAM is, however, much slower than the registers, and most of the CPU's instructions require data to be moved to the registers before any operation can be performed on it. The CPU has the ability to perform operations described in this instruction list. These are composed of a text label, which identifies them, and one or more operators that change meaning depending on the function. But the labels are just for human consumption. Once the program is ready, all the instructions are converted to numbers according to the CPU's specifications, and the numbers are saved on a memory chip, which is then stuffed in a cartridge. The instructions are then read by the CPU and executed in order. This is the rawest, closest way that we can talk to a computer. We are using its most basic capabilities to tell it exactly what to do step by step, which means that we have total control over the system, but also that it's a gigantic pain to do even the most simple of things. Let me show you a few examples of instructions so we can better understand why. 
LDAB. This is the load function, one of the most used and important. It simply takes a value from the second operator and copies it to the first. In this case, the instruction tells the CPU to take the value that's stored in the B register and copy it to the A register. ADDA27. This function, as the label implies, is used for addition. It simply adds the second operator to the first. The second operator can be a number, a register, or a memory location. This function, however, is a demonstration of how the accumulator register is special, as the first operator must always be A. The CPU simply does not perform additions on anything else. This means that if you have to sum a few things together, you'll have to shuffle them between memory and registers. JPNZ8000H. This is a jump instruction. The first operator is a comparison, while the second is the address of the next instruction to execute in case the condition is verified. In this example, we're telling the CPU to jump to address 8000 hexadecimal if the result of the previous mathematical operation was not zero. Halt. Halt is a functional instruction. It pauses the Game Boy's CPU until a new screen refresh is complete or other timers wake it up. This function is incredibly useful as it can dramatically increase the battery life by suspending operations whenever possible. This is, in a general sense, the full extent of the Game Boy's programming capabilities. The remaining instructions mainly perform other kinds of mathematical operations, like subtraction, bit shifting, some limited 16-bit operations, and so on. This programming language, so close to a computer's heart, is called assembly and is light years from the high-level approach that we are used to nowadays. Most modern programming languages are very similar to plain English, and some are incredibly understandable even without much programming knowledge. To understand just how much of a pain programming in assembly is, let's write some basic code for updating an imaginary life counter when the score goes above 100. We'll do it in Python first, then in assembly. Score equals zero. First we tell Python to create a variable in memory to hold the score and set it to zero. Then our game will do a bunch of stuff, and at some point we will have to increase the score. Score equals score plus one. Now we need to check if increasing the score just made it go beyond 100. If score is greater than 100, score equals zero. To reset the score to zero and life equals life plus one to increase the life counter by one. Done. Now let's do it in assembly. As we've seen, assembly deals with registers, numbers, or memory addresses, but one of the limitations of the Game Boy CPU is that we can't put a number straight in memory. We have to first go through register A. LDA0 to put 0 into A, then LD8000H A to copy the contents of A into memory location 8000 hexadecimal. Assembly doesn't support generic variables, so we need to decide that the score is going to be saved in a specific position in memory, whereas all Python needed was a name. The game is then going to go on until we need to increase the score. Additions can only be done on A, so let's copy the score back. LDA 8000H, increment it by 1, INC A, and put it back in memory. LD 8000H A. Now, we subtract 100 from A, sub 100, and JPC after. We jump to the position labeled after if the previous operation went below zero, which happens when the score is less than 100. Now this following instruction will only be executed if we did not go below zero. So, we set A back to zero with LDA zero, then LD8000H A, to copy it back in the memory location for the score, then LDA 8001H to load the memory location for the lives into A. Now we increment it, INC A, and we save it back to memory with LD 8001H A. Now we can write the after label to which we will jump when the score is not above 100. Whew, that's quite a bit more than those five lines of Python. This gives you a glimpse of how time-consuming and painstaking assembly programming is. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, why didn't they just use a better programming language? The answer is that better programming languages, in the end, are always converted to assembly because assembly is the only thing a computer actually understands.
The difference is that the conversion is done automatically by other programs called compilers. And while they've become incredibly good and efficient in recent years, back then they would have produced sloppy and inefficient assembly code. High-level languages also make life easier for humans by taking care of a lot of things behind the scenes. For example, the score variable we used in Python could have contained a sentence instead by writing score equals hello world. With this modification, the score equals score plus one operation would have returned an error, complaining that you can't add a number to some text. This feature is called weak typing, and it basically means that the language doesn't need to be told in advance what you're going to put in a variable. Behind the scenes, though, this requires considerable effort, which the measly Game Boy CPU simply cannot handle. On the other hand, the reward for the massive effort of programming in assembly is that having such close control of the hardware allows you to do things in the fastest possible way. A particularly significant example of using assembly in a modern game is Roller Coaster Tycoon. Despite higher level languages being the standard in 1999, programmer Chris Sawyer decided to instead write the game completely in assembly. This massive feat of software engineering and dedication not only made the game able to handle hundreds of individual part guests, events, and attractions without any hiccups on low-end machines, but also rewarded Chris for his efforts by granting him huge royalties on the game's sales. He ended up receiving about $30 million of the $180 million brought in by the game. So, to sum up this first round of information, Game Boy, CPU, Cartridge, RAM. The CPU reads instructions and data from the cartridge, crunches numbers, and stores most of them in RAM for ready consumption. But how does all this allow a game to appear on the screen? Or generate audio? How does it know what keys we're pressing? We'll find out in the next video. Until then, thanks for watching.